Hi, I'm Shannon Mouton Gray, Managing Director at McKinney and Associates, and welcome to this month's Tips in 20. We here at McKinney know it doesn't take a whole lot of time to help people do better and be better. And so with these tips in 20 minutes of your time, we hope to make you a better professional. So let's get started, shall we? Ron? Sure thing. I want to quickly give a shout out to the gentleman I just mentioned, Ron, my partner in crime. He's the man behind the scenes, making it happen and keeping me on task. Thanks, Ron. You're welcome, Shannon. With today's webinar, 10 Ways to Make a Memorable Impression, I'll share pointers with you to help you be remembered beyond the first impression. And let me say for the record, while today's presentation is focused on making a memorable impression for your organization or your business, several of these tips can be adapted for personal use. I will not tell you which ones, um, but I do know from personal experience that they can be adapted to your personal life. Suffice it to say, I was once single and I'm not anymore. Woo woo! Shout out to my honey bunny. Now, Let's get back to business. Too often, we base our entire business relationship on the first impression, and we put a lot of stock in it. Did I give a firm handshake? Did I engage in small talk, or did we have a real conversation? How will I stand out from the crowd at the event? Will the speaker even remember that I was there? These are just a few of the thoughts that run through our minds when networking, meeting people for the first time, or even pitching an idea. And while I'm not undercutting the importance of first impressions, it is memorable impressions we need to focus on. I cannot stress this enough. Preparation is key to so many things in life, including being remembered and making a good impression. It can help reduce your anxiety and give you that booted, that boost of confidence that you need. Um, for a potential client meeting, you want to learn everything you can about the person or key people you'll be meeting with. This is what social media does best. Go trolling people. Go to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and even Pinterest. Visit the company website read bios, learn about the board of directors or the senior leadership and C-suite team, learn more about the company history, what they've done, what, they look, what they're looking to do, and what may be something that there are natural synergies where you and your team can fit in. You also want to check out recent news releases. And then finally, you want to familiarize yourself with the overall industry and brush up on current events. For the truly ambitious, if you want to be prepped to the nth degree, if it's a business social event, try to get your hands on the RSVP list. And again, troll social media, especially LinkedIn. Learn about their background as well as their hobbies and interests. Use this kind of information to break the ice with small talk before you dive in for the business kill. This is all part of being intentional. Being intentional. Consider who may be in the room and the interactions or conversations you want to have to make the event successful for you. Remember, time is our most precious resource and we can't afford to waste it. Folks are folks, people are people, and many of the people that you'll be meeting are as uncomfortable and anxious as you are. Tell yourself, you are wonderful. This isn't just self-talk. It's true. You are wonderful. See what you can do to help make the people you're speaking with more comfortable. And at the same time, they're probably trying to see how they can make you more comfortable. It's a win-win for everybody. You're comfortable. They're comfortable. We're all comfortable. So take a few deep breaths. In. Out. Once more. In, out, roll your shoulders a couple of times. Yes, I'm doing it. And then go be your fantastic self. I do these tricks before I do every webinar too. 
in the presence of real people, you know, living, breathing human beings, the zombie apocalypse has not come yet. In the presence of real people, put away your devices and pay attention to the real people you're talking to. As a true geek diva, I admit I'm the first one that thinks putting away my phone is just a sacrilege. It does cause me great personal angst and a little bit of nervousness. However, on the real deal, as the managing director here at McKinney, which is a communications consulting firm, and I have business development as one of my major responsibilities, I know the importance of giving a potential client my undivided attention. Nothing can kill a conversation I'm having faster than my cell phone going off, making all kinds of noises as text, tweets, rings, and other kinds of things are happening. Don't even think about answering my phone. It's not an option. If a text message comes through, they'll text again. If the phone goes off, it'll go off again. Turn it off, folks. Turn it off. Eye contact. This is important. It not only lets the person you're speaking to know that you're paying attention, it is truly a sign of respect and sincerity. It's also a way to develop a connection and start building trust. Folks who make eye contact tend to be judged as more believable, confident, and competent. Now, let me just say, there is such a thing as too much eye contact. It's called staring and being creepy, people. First, remember to blink. It's an underrated ability that most of us do naturally. However, when we're nervous, we can freeze up and our eyes can bulge out. Second, every so often you want to glance away, not down at the floor that makes you look weak, and definitely not at your device. Remember, we've already turned it off and put it away. You just want to glance over the shoulder of the person you're speaking to. Um, and this breaks up the glare that you're giving and helps you not look creepy. Ooh, great little trick here. Repeat, repeat, repeat. First and most importantly, it lets the speaker know you're listening. Second, it brings clarity to what's being discussed. If Susan is, is explaining thingy production and you repeat it back to her, she can provide additional information or clarification in case you misunderstood or misheard something. And third, it actually helps you remember what the speaker said, which you can use in follow-up communications. Now, this is not the time to rehash the story of the person who cut you off on 495 heading into work, nor is it the time to talk about the fact that the red line was jacked up yet again, nor is it the time to talk about how your mother-in-law doesn't understand you. None of those are good ways to make a memorable, positive, good impression for you and your organization. You want to keep your attitude and the conversation upbeat and positive. You, want, you don't want to be remembered as the Debbie Downer or the negative Ned. Oh, yes. Questions, questions, questions. And yes, teachers are right. There is no such thing as a dumb question except the one that isn't asked. If you take nothing else away from today's presentation, please take this one to heart. There is no, and I mean absolutely no, better way to demonstrate interest than with personal questions. And let me just stay here for a moment. A pertinent question, a relevant question, a timely and informed question is one that illustrates to the speaker that you have been paying attention to what has been said. Yes, you may have your own agenda, and yes, you wanna speak about what you wanna speak about, and yes, you have certain people you're trying to get to and don't wanna be stuck talking to the same person, 
Guess what, folks? It's not about you. It's about the speaker. And for the time that you all are together, they are the center of your world, even if only for five minutes. And it's about being remembered in a positive light after you have parted each other's company. This is an oldie and a goodie and definitely worth repeating. This is a great way to remember names and to make associations of people and places, again, for recall later and in follow-up conversations and emails. Ooh, for us Downton Abbey fans, we know all too well that the 19th and early 20th centuries, social interaction was a richly cultivated and well-mannered affair. I'm telling you, Downton Abbey is nothing else, if nothing else, it is a true picture into Manners 101. It's amazing to me. The tool that facilitated many of these interactions was the calling card. Calling cards streamlined introductions and helped remind people of new acquaintances and needed visits. The calling card also served as a way to brand your social identity. The way your card looked or felt or the way you handed it to someone communicated your standing and relationship with the receiver. Nowadays, we use business cards, the modern calling card, and it does pretty much the same thing. It provides a chance to enhance the impression you make and gives your new acquaintances the ability to pursue a relationship with you in the way that they feel most comfortable via the various points of contact that you put on your card. Now, I'm going to park here for a minute and pause for the cause. Um, as you can see from this slide here, um, I'm going to give three sub tips on business cards. Um, as I just said, uh, a business card gives the person you've spoken with a way to get in contact with you that's comfortable for them. This is possible, though, only if you put all of your professional contact information on the card. That includes your business phone, if you use your mobile phone for business, your email, and possibly even your address, your office address, if you're able to accept walk-ins. Now, this also means including your social media profiles if you use your social media profiles for business. If you use Twitter to rant and rail against the world, don't put it on a business card. If you use social media, if you use Facebook in particular to look at cat videos, rail against the world more, and to keep up with high school friends, don't put that on your business card. Okay, we clear? Business cards need business contacts. Go with the flow, folks. The second tip goes back to the basics of Communications 101. Consider your audience. I recommend actually having multiple versions of your business cards and determine which one to hand out based on your audience. And last, but certainly not least, in the name of all that is good and holy in the world, please, I cannot stress this enough, keep your business card design simple. 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 <laughs> Creativity is great. It has its place, but not at the expense of common sense, sound judgment, and sharing information in a clear, succinct, and professional manner. You see the slide? Don't do any of those things. And finally, our number 10 tip for today. You do want to be ahead of the pack. Get in touch with folks. Reach out. Say hello. Why put off till tomorrow what you can do today? It's now time for the Q&A portion of the program. So please place your tray tables in the upright position and hand your trash to the attendants as they make their final pass through the cabin. And don't forget to type your questions in the Q&A box. Should be up there, I'm just saying me. But it should be up there for you to type your Q&A, for you to type your questions. 
um, as we did last month, we put this out on Twitter, and so uh, Ron was able to collect some questions for me. So we'll get started on those as we wait for you all to get your questions up there. Um, Ron, how are we doing on time? We have about five minutes. Ooh, all righty then. Let's get going. Can you write down information or take down information on your smartphone if you don't have a business card with you? Yes. When I say put your phones away, that is truly during the conversation portion. It would be rude, for instance, right now, if I were to stop talking and doing this webinar and go to my phone to answer it or send a text. However, during a conversation, if it's, you get to the point where you want to exchange information and you either don't have cards, you don't use cards, or you're out of cards, whatever, then yes, pulling your cell phone out is truly acceptable. Um, I remember about five or six years ago, there used to be an app called Bump where you tap your phones and transfer information. And I believe there are other applications that do that. So if the person you're speaking with feels comfortable doing that, then that's okay. Um, again, the, I was really talking about not using your phone during the conversation, not as a way to exchange information. Oh, and so there's a question, what can I do to not appear desperate? Desperation comes off, and another way, excuse me, I'm seeing hair in my face. Desperation comes off also as a lack of confidence. So confident people don't tend to um, appear desperate. I want to use your language. So again, hi, nice to meet you. So, uh, da, da, da. what do you do? You want to engage them, ask them questions. Um, so what brings you here tonight? How long have you been with so-and-so? I see you have X, Y, and Z lapel pin on. What does that represent? Get them talking. Listen to them. Um, the more they talk, the better it is for you. So I hope I answered your question. Let me go back to the Twitter questions. What if my interesting hobby is collecting stamps? Should I throw that into the conversation? Definitely. Just like you've looked up their hobbies and interests, they may or may not have looked up yours. Um, stamp collecting is a great one to throw in because stamps cover the wide range of society. There are historical stamps, archival stamps, there are art stamps, stamps that represent music, history, presidents, women, ethnicities, religions, so you can cover the gamut with stamps. Um, I would suggest, though, that you talk about the macro of whatever your hobby is, not necessarily the macro and minuteness of it, but the large, the largeness of it and the, the generalities of whatever your hobby is. Um, there are more synergies with us um, as people between us than there are differences. So that's what you really want to focus on are the similarities. I collect stamps. Do you collect something? What do you collect? You don't collect anything. Have you ever thought of it? Did you ever? Do you know? There are ways to just continue a conversation. Again, that's what it's about. You want to be remembered. And I believe Ron's telling me I have time for one more question. Man, okay. How can you ask the questions you want to ask and the questions you need to ask if to, okay, reading is fundamental, people. How can you ask the questions you want to ask and the questions you need to ask to let people know you're engaged and paying attention? Oh, okay. I understand now. So um, there are questions to get the speaker engaged, to get them talking. Then you need to pivot and shift in order to be able to deliver your message. Um, there, there's a fine line. You, if you are talking about, I'll use this stamp collecting, you don't automatically want to shift. So we now have this new widget we'd like you to buy. No, there's this, this comes with practice. And I do suggest if you're going into a new situation that you may want to practice with coworkers, friends, spouse, loved one, significant other, just kind of practice some small talk too, especially if this is new to you. Um, but there is a way so you collect stamps. Oh, well, do you know there's a stamp that's being dedicated to X, Y, and Z inventor? He started the boom, boom, boom. 
our company is now built 25 years later and we've developed X, Y, and Z to supplement Boom Boom. It's a thread and it's okay. It really is okay to, to kind of draw those threads together and weave together cloth. Do what you need to, to accomplish your goals and be, mem and be remembered without insulting and disengaging from the person you're speaking with. That's the trick. Well, uh, Ron's giving me the signal. Okay, so I have to stop now. Again, I'm Shannon Mouton with McKinney and Associates. I want to thank you for joining us for today's Tips in 20, 10 Ways to Make a Memorable Impression. Uh, you can find McKinney on the internet at mckpr.com. You can sign up for our monthly newsletter. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and SlideShare. Uh, be sure and join us for next week's, next month, next month's Tips in 20. Ooh, holiday themed. 12 days of resume writing. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you around the internet.